So we finish a series of messages from Matthew chapter 8. And uh, I decided that we'll continue with Matthew chapter 9 to finish this uh, month of October. So we will go to Matthew chapter 9 and uh, look at uh, uh, different accounts here. Actually, today we're going to look at the calling of Matthew. Uh, the reason why I started with this is because uh, not too long ago, I actually uh, gave a sermon from uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to, uh, 1 to 8. And so we're going to go ahead and start with Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. And uh, next month, since it will be the month of uh, November, we will start a series of messages about Thanksgiving because it is Thanksgiving month. Yeah, we have a lot of things uh, happening actually uh, here in this church also. Like at the end of the month, we will have our harvest party. And then uh, the first Sunday of the month, we will have our yearly congregational meeting. And uh, the second Sunday of November, we will have our yearly Thanksgiving dinner. So we'll eat a lot of turkey. So I hope you're planning on joining us for that. And, of course, everyone's going to be busy preparing for Thanksgiving and, of course, for Christmas, right? So, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. But before we read this passage, uh, let me just ask you this question. Have you received a call that you felt you had to take? So, even like in the middle of something that you're doing, you looked at your cell phone, it was from someone that you have been waiting to hear from maybe, and then you saw the name and you go, oh, excuse me, I really have to take this. We've all done that, right? I really have to take this. It might be that because you have been expecting a call or waiting for a call, and so you say to the person you were with, uh, excuse me, I really just have to take this call. Like, I cannot reject this call. I cannot take this call down. I, I have to answer it because this is very, very important. All right? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today from Matthew chapter 9. And actually, the title of our message is Jesus Calls. He really does. Okay? So let's look at Matthew 9. Verses 9 to 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened. That as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, Many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word. So, this passage is, has a heading. If, you, if you're looking at your Bible right now, it probably has a heading that says, The Calling of Matthew, or Jesus Calls Matthew. So, the title of our message, as I said, is that Jesus Calls. Why? Because we believe that whatever is written in the Scripture applies to us now. We ask the question, how does this passage applied to me. If I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, 
and that the Bible is given by God to us to reveal himself to us and to tell us his will. So the question for us is, how does this passage apply to me today? So here we read an account of Jesus after he had done some ministries already after he crossed the lake. Now it says that when he went from there, he saw a man called Matthew. And you will notice that the book that we are studying, written by Matthew himself. So he's basically telling us how Jesus found him and called him to follow him. All right? So, point number one that I would like for us to see from this passage is this. Jesus calls us to follow him. If you remember last week, the title of our message was Following Jesus, right? And in our message last week, we confirmed from the scripture directly from what Jesus said that following Jesus is more important than earthly comfort. That means even if it gets so uncomfortable, we must remain in following Jesus. We also said in our study last week that following Jesus is more important than any responsibility we have on earth. So now, here is Matthew telling us that while he was sitting at the gate or at a booth collecting taxes, that means he was at work. He was at work. He was sitting in his booth collecting taxes. That is when Jesus found him and told him to follow him. He was told by Jesus, Matthew, follow me. Today, Jesus still calls people to follow him. And I believe probably every one of us have made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. We have counted the cost. We know that it's more important than any responsibility we have in life. We know that it's more important than earthly comfort. We know that what Jesus offers us is a million times greater and better than what the world can offer us. And so we made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. But actually, even as we are following Jesus Christ now, just like when a little kid follows his or her parents, a little kid can get distracted so easily, right? Maybe the little kid will see a flower and will stop and want it to smell the flower. And so the mom or the dad who's guiding that child would always look back and see if the child is following, right? Yeah, we, we do that. Sometimes the child really is not a good follower. We just go ahead and hold a hand and just drag that child, right? <laughs> Like, follow me, stay with me, right? You know, we are like little children, actually. In the course of our following Jesus, we get distracted, don't we? It's easy to get distracted, as a matter of fact. Why? People say, because life happens. Because life happens. You know, this... Uh, past May, if you remember, we have two cars that got totaled and took so long to find a replacement car that will fit the money that was given to us by the insurance. And we found this place and uh, the guy was, was, was really nice. And so uh, uh, we got to talking and I told him that I was a pastor and uh, he said, oh yeah, I used to be really involved in the church. Uh, he said, when I was a teenager, that is, he said, or that was. And then I asked him, said, so where do you go to church now? He said, uh, I don't. I said, what happened? And he said, life happened. I got married, had children, had to make a living. 
He said, I really need to go back because my children are growing up. And uh, not having the opportunity like I had growing up when my parents took me to church. He said, life happens. We get distracted. And there are many things here in life that can really distract us. That is why, just like our parents when we were kids, Jesus continues to tell us, hey, follow me. Follow me. Don't get distracted. Jesus calls us where we are right now. So it's always good for us to check which part of my life is not aligned with following Jesus. Because that's what Jesus would like for us to do. To make sure that every aspect of our lives is aligned with him in following him. And you know what? Like I said last week, we must not wait. Why? Because we don't know what could happen tomorrow. You know, just like, look at what happened in Israel. All of a sudden, they were attacked. And the crazy thing about that is that if you will talk to even our uh, administration, they're saying that, oh, everything is going well there. As a matter of fact, we don't have to deal with a lot of things in the Middle East this year, so everything is going well. And it's just like what the Bible says, just when everyone is saying, peace, peace, then that's when trouble will come. We don't know what could happen tomorrow. So when Jesus tells us, follow me now, even though we've already made a decision many, probably years ago, but now we are getting distracted by things that are happening in life, we still must make a decision to maintain ourselves in following Jesus Christ. Because the mission for us remains the same. There are people dying who do not know Christ. And God wants to use us to tell him, to tell them about him. And that's point number two. When Jesus calls us, just like he called Matthew, Jesus will use us so others may come to him. The account here tells us that then it happened. That as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came. Why did they specify, or why did Matthew specify many tax collectors and sinners? He was a tax collector. He probably, saw, he probably got up from his booth, tax collector's booth, and followed him. And everyone said, what is Matthew doing? What's Matthew doing? He said, he started following Jesus. And then Jesus started dining with him, and all of a sudden, all these tax collectors started coming. Remember how Jesus calls us where we are and who we are. And when we make a choice to follow him, the people around us who see our decision to follow Christ will become curi curious about it. And hopefully, just like what happened with the friends of Matthew, they will start coming to Jesus. Because you see, in following Jesus Christ, especially because Jesus now had gone to heaven to prepare a place for us in heaven, the only agency by which Jesus is using to make his word known to the world is human agency. He can actually, if he wants to, 
just send angels everywhere and start talking to people about Jesus Christ. But, but, but no, that's not his design. His design is to use each one of us human beings to tell another human being about Jesus Christ. Our obedience to follow Jesus will lead others to come to Jesus. We have to see it that way. That God can use our obedience to follow him so that others will also follow him. As parents, we do that for our children. Our children look at us, whether we are really following Jesus or not. Of course, it is true that our children do have their own ability to decide on whatever they want. <coughs> and it's sad that sometimes our children decide not to follow, even if they see us following. But the good news about that situation is that those children who heard of Jesus Christ in their younger years when even after they leave for sometimes they said 20, 25 years, later on in life, they are reminded of what they heard years ago. And they make decisions to come back. Because they come to realize the importance of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Especially if they continue to see in us the desire to continue to follow Jesus. And in this also, Jesus is saying that what Jesus wants us to do is to bring sinners who will follow him. Who will follow him. Our focus really are those people who are not in Christ yet. Sometimes it's easier to invite those who are already in Christ and already involved in another church to come join us here, right? It's easier to do that because you already have a common ground. You're both followers and believers of Jesus Christ. But to go to someone who does not know Jesus Christ, sometimes we are intimidated and we feel like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't have anything in common, common with this person. But if you see Matthew, it was the tax collectors and sinners that came to dine with Jesus Christ. The amazing thing here is that these tax collectors and sinners we're not intimidated by Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus came to Matthew and said, Matthew, follow me. A person who was probably hated in his community because he's collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. And yet Jesus comes to him and says, hey, follow me. And so when the other tax collectors saw this, they decided to come to Jesus also. Now here's the sad part. When the Pharisees, the supposed religious leaders of their time, saw that tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus, they said to the disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? You see, to these people, Christianity or following Jesus is only for the righteous. Actually, you hear this a lot from other people also who would like to follow Christ. There are those who said, yeah, I, I know I need to be in church. I know I need to follow Christ. And then they say, but you know what? I got to get my life in order yet. Then I will follow. Right? I got to get my life in order first. 
then I will follow Jesus. Here's Matthew being called by Jesus to follow him, and uh, Matthew didn't say, uh, don't you see I'm a tax collector? <laughs> I'm a sinner. Let, let, let me uh, save enough money, then I will resign from this job, and then I will follow you, Jesus. You remember last week's message, right? Remember the excuses that the other said? Let me bury my father first. In other accounts, said, let me go to a wedding first, or let me sell my land first. Or, and Jesus said, no, you follow me now. Now. Because we don't know what could happen tomorrow. You see, these Pharisees, who are thought off to be spiritual religious leaders of their time, said, Jesus, if he really is the Messiah, he should not be mingling with tax collectors and sinners. Because if he is truly from God, he should only mingle with the righteous people. And of course, they're thinking of themselves as the righteous ones. Like I said, that is why many times people who are not in church believe that church is only for those who are really good people. <laughs> right? That's what people on the outside think. Because there are people on the inside, like the Pharisees, who project that. That you have to be good and perfect to become a part of the church. These religious leaders believe that their self-righteousness will save them. And there are many in the church who also believe that. That their salvation is dependent on how righteous they are on their own will. But the Bible tells us that there's no righteousness in any of us. That is why Jesus imparted and imputed his righteousness to be upon us. So that we who are sinners could be made the righteousness of God. That's exactly what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Our salvation is dependent on the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us. Paul himself says in Philippians that when he stands before God at the end, he said his prayer is that he may be found not having a righteousness of his own derived from obedience to the law, but a righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. See, these Pharisees thought that it is their righteousness that will save them. And so they also thought that if you are to follow Jesus Christ, you have to be very righteous. But Jesus answered them and said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus came to call the sinners. And of course, like I said, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, there is none righteous, not even one. Among all human beings, no one is righteous. Only Jesus Christ lived a sinless life and yet died on the cross like a sinner 
for us. For us. We need him so bad in our lives. Not only so that we may have the salvation that we need for eternity, but also for the life that we live here on earth now. Because like I said, as children following our father, we get so distracted. And so when we do, when life happens, more trouble and problems happen also. And apart from Jesus Christ, we would not know what to do. So even as we live our lives here on earth, after having been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, we continue to need Jesus in our lives as a physician who heals. Because even as Christians, we still get sick, right? Physically, emotionally, spiritually. And we can always come to Jesus and his promise is that he will bring healing to us. He will give us hope. He will remind of us of his love for him. Because as he quoted from the Old Testament, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. He's not saying that he does not want our sacrifices or the sacrifices in the Old Testament that was offered. But he's telling us that he is a compassionate God. He is a compassionate God. And that he would rather see us showing compassion after we have received compassion from him so that we may give it to others. He wants us to learn and to have and to practice his compassion. If we have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, we would not have that compassion. But because we have Jesus Christ in us, then the compassion of God is upon us because we have received it, and we can now share it and practice it and show it to others who also need compassion. And when we do, then we will have an opportunity to share with others the compassion of Jesus Christ for those who are lost.